George Dunbar Mining the Surfaces is presented by Donna and Ben Rosen and Bright Family Foundation and by the Hellas Foundation, the Selly Foundation Fund of the Greater New Orleans Foundation, Callan Contemporary, Fresh Poorman Roland Group, Alan Leventhal, Parkside Foundation, and Michelle Rainoir and Kevin Clifford. Additional funding provided by Michael Kearney, JKP Family Foundation, Simon Gunning, and Goldring Family Foundation. I like to paint in such a way that certain things can happen. I refer to them as accidental triumphs. George has a certain style that's all his own, down to the landscaping of the property, his clothing, the way he sets a table for a dinner, the paintings, his thumbprint touches it all. You can't help but feel it and understand you're in his Dunbar world. And remember going in his house with my mother and walking around and, wow, I've never seen a house like this. It's such a cool house. And I remember going home and asking my mother, I think I was in fourth grade. I said, Mom, is George Dunbar a beatnik? I remember her saying to me, you know, George's artwork and George are both very sexy. When I grew up, got older, I realized she was right about that. He is very sexy, and so is his work. I mean, what, what other 94-year-old man can wear a bandana tied around his neck, designer tight jeans, okay, and look good? Like, really look chic and look good. George is a rogue, you know? He is a, he's playful, he's clever, he's introspective, um, very, very deep, and yet approachable. He's impish. He's got a childlike uh, love of life, um, and he's generous, and he's smart, and he's loving and caring. He has no ego. He's a very modest man. His elegance, his warmth, his manners are very appealing. I don't think I've ever taken anyone to a studio that hasn't basically fallen in love with George Dunbar. My friend, Vesta, sorry Vesta. <laughs> You're gonna out her. <laughs> totally gonna out her. She's known George and Louisette forever, but she and George had a, a fun flirtation. I mean, you know, absolutely nothing. And at the time he was probably 50 years older than her, but uh, we recently were there for dinner and she was, and she's single. She was like, oh God. I mean, I could still go for that. <laughs> age, age 90. <sighs> he, the man has sex appeal. Is he shaking? The sharp ones. Yeah. I think one of the reasons I keep working is I always feel I can do it better. Perfect. When I stop feeling that way, I might throw in the towel. So George takes the decorative art, he roughs it up, he patinas it, he gives it character. It's more than pretty. He always used to say, you gotta walk right up to the edge of ugly. If you don't get there, it's just pretty. And it has nothing important. What I love so much about all of them is that they are kind of brutalistic. It's that fine line of like, is it ugly? Is it beautiful? There's, there's something that it's not so perfect and pretty that you're like bored. The Rag series, they're brutal. They're certainly not just pretty paintings. They're pretty challenging, really. George really takes the surface of a painting and makes it deliberately three-dimensional while playing off motifs and designs that find their way into his visual vocabulary. George's art is so much about texture. So I think that it's very easy to shoot his work. Everything has shape and dimension and it catches light and it looks different as the light changes. The thing about George Dunbar is that he has created an entirely new art form. When you look at George's work, it's not 
a painting. When you go to his studio, what there are is sharp metallic tools that he uses to shape the clay. And those are his brushes. So you can't even describe George's work as really a painting or even a low relief sculpture. It's something in between. This is what makes his work so unique and so signatory. I never got to meet my grandfather or my grandmother on my dad's side. Uh, I heard incredible stories about my, um, my grandmother. She was, a, she was an athlete, she was a tennis player, and a very elegant woman. And I've learned a great deal about his, his father, a uh, very well-respected lawyer in the city. There's actually an award given every year in his honor. George attended Country Day from first grade through 12th. He graduated in 1945. And in those days, his parents were often out of town, so he would board here. I think we can claim George as our own, but the notion that somehow he was inspired to be an artist from Country Day wouldn't be true. He was more interested in playing football, and he was a quarterback. But he also loved to draw, and he, would, and he drew everything that he could, that he could find. He talks a lot about what makes an artist that stands the test of time, and that is when you look at their body of work, there is some through thread that you can tell, oh, that's George Dunbar. And I was like, well, how did you know what your voice was? How did you find your voice? Who is George Dunbar? And he sat there for a second, and then he told me the story of his mother and him when they would go to New York when he was around six years old. She would leave her son at the Metropolitan Museum, age six, and say, darling, I'll be back at three. Meet me on the steps in front of the statue. And he'd be like, bye. I really got to know the museum. I made judgments. Looking back at it, I was making judgments as to what I really liked. Nobody was telling me what I liked, so I was making those judgments on my own. And he said he had those three hours as a six-year-old to have the adventure of a life. My parents had passes on even the United Fruit ships when I was a teenager. I could go to Cuba on the weekend, overnight. Cuba was wide open then. Travel played a big part in my art development. I went into the service and I really didn't have that much time to think about it. You had to get your parents' written permission at 17. My mother had trained to be an ambulance driver in World War I. She said, I'll only sign the papers if you go in the Navy. So that wasn't even a choice. I became a salvage diver around Manila in the Philippines. At first it was dirty work, it was bringing up bodies and things of that kind. But it later turned into just patching up ships so we could raise them and get them out of the harbor. When I got out of the service, I felt more independent than I was on the GI Bill of Rights Act. So when they said, why don't you study law, it was a very easy answer. I think I'm going to take a shot at art. <laughs> I was paying for it, at least the government was. I think the real artist I really knew wasn't until I really went to Tyler. Tyler was an art school for Temple University. I picked Tyler for two reasons. I took it because it was close to New York and I could go listen to jazz. The jazz musicians had left New Orleans and gone to New York. After World War II and even events preceding that, um, the art world was essentially looking for a rebellion and moving away from a lot of the traditional concepts of uh, late 19th century and early 20th century art. 
going to school at the university in Philadelphia gave him access, proximity, and a sense of urgency. Um, because the abstract expressionists of the New York School were developing in real time. At Tyler, not only was he exposed to this new language of abstract expressionism, but he was exposed to classical techniques. He learned to grind his own pigments, mix his own paints. So there is a real devotion uh, to the medium, and not just the language of abstraction, but to the, to the craftsmanship of these pieces. Art was taking a definite move at that time. He first started in Paris and ended in New York, and that's why that became such an important place to be when you were studying art. I met people like Aaron Chickler and people like Dave Levine. Dave Levine was a very good character to us. A lot of the covers of Time and Newsweek were his covers. Aaron Chickler did Kennedy's portrait and things like that. The first real nationally known artist I knew was Franz Klein. Right out of school, I showed with him at, right there in the middle of Philadelphia, small gallery. He made a great impression on me. He became very aware of what was happening in the New York School. So you have the Pollocks, the Kleins, but you also have Andy Warhol. And I don't think that people realize the impact that Warhol had on Dunbar's work. And then you also had Marcel Duchamp opening doors. All of that impacted George. Enrique Alvarez and his wife, his friends from Mexico. George and Enrique were competitors. They respected each other. I think they loved each other. And so with that incredible sweep up of all this energy from the Parisian capital to New York City, and where New York became an epicenter and pilgrimage for most artists to undertake, there were artists always leaving it as well. They would kind of begin to see little communities wherever they were. Dunbar was at a moment of incredible opportunity. It would take some real vision and inspiration to begin an epic revolution of modernity in a city that is based largely on antiquity. My mother gave me a trip to Europe when I got out of school, and she became ill and it turned out to be terminal. I flew back over the North Pole. I refueled in Iceland. It was before Jens to get back here as quickly as I could. His plan was to stay in New York, set up a studio, be part of that scene, but a uh, family illness brought him home to New Orleans and he realized how much he loved this place. He came here and uh, started making frequent trips to Mexico. George was definitely a devotee of the New York School of Painting, but he did find influence from the Baroque colonial churches and that gilded patina uh, that he found in Mexico City that he'd obviously seen in Europe as well. He brought to the language of abstraction uh, in his surfaces. There was a history and tradition of artists of the abstract expressionist movement through the school at Newcomb, which is now Tulane University. Artists who weren't just creating courtyard scenes or historic French Quarter vignettes or paintings of long ago battles. I realized there were a few serious artists in New Orleans that were contemporary. We had about eight people that formed the Orleans Gallery. It was the biggest step forward contemporary art ever took in New Orleans. We wanted to show in a place that didn't have furniture and other things like decorator shops. We wanted to have a sterile wall, a white wall, and a white floor. And uh, we had that. The location that we finally ended up in is right where you see the historical New Orleans collection on Royal Street. He brought a different perspective to um, a somewhat insulated city at the time. 
his greatest gift was his generosity of spirit and his um, ability to convene like-minded people and really push those boundaries. He was really the tip of the spear for modernism. He set the concepts of abstract expressionism and modernism. All of those members of Orleans Gallery, they really defined what contemporary art was gonna look like in New Orleans. So for Dunbar and that group to come in with the bold work that they did and the very fresh and new and exciting, energetic and amazing, maybe even sort of bombastic and loud opportunities, put the artwork on the wall in places that people weren't used to seeing, it was a great move. Certainly the impact of the Orleans Gallery on a antique laden city was relevatory and way ahead of its time. It was actually one of the few contemporary abstract galleries outside New York City. The Orleans Gallery, evolving into Gallery Simone Stern, raised a level of sophistication among the citizenry of New Orleans that they'd never seen before. So you can live in New Orleans and you can live a respectable, in fact, a highly respected life as an artist. One of the marvelous things about New Orleans is that she loves her artist, but George helped nurture that love. I never knew the significance of the name Dunbar. Um, I knew my dad did artwork and I knew he showed that artwork, but as a kid, you thought that was kind of silly and especially it was abstract work. So um, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. He also had strange friends that would come over. They were always smoking and they were always drinking. My dad left the city because he wanted to get away from the city life. And uh, he wanted us to roam around, be free. And I can honestly say, um, I spent every minute outside, uh, swimming across the bayou, tromping out in the marsh. My mother was always a city girl. And she came over here gamely as, as the sort of pioneering woman and helped create this kind of Camelot with my dad. Um, you know, she was creative in her own right and an artist, but um, a lot of her work ended up being uh, in the art of creating amazing parties. She was a character, she was a piece of work. Um, she, uh, she wore black lipstick, huge sunglasses. She had a bandana that she wore on her head. A uh, very beautiful woman, very striking and she had a wicked sense of humor. They were a perfect pair at that, at that point. So that is the world that Jane and George lived in and invited all their friends to, to participate in. Volleyball games and goats and, you know, it was guinea, guineas and peacocks. And, you know, we'd play hearts for hours. We'd swim nude if we felt like it. It was just, uh, was just magical. Jane, elegant, glamorous, bohemian, George, the courtly gentleman, always so gracious, uh, twinkle in his eye, in a bandana, Jane wore a bandana. They were bohemian chic. They became known as George and Jane of the jungle, <laughs> and people would you know, just want to come here. <laughs> I, at some point, uh, was, got married and decided I needed to make more money. <laughs> and uh, I started to uh, develop, develop real estate. I could go out, I could dig canals, I could uh, work on some of the equipment myself, like bulldozers and things. 
You know, we say George is down to earth, and sometimes we mean it because he's literally moving the earth when he's doing one of his developments, but he's very grounded in a different way. He's down to earth because he's affable, likable. He's not full of himself, and I think that may come from having this sense of home, this sense of place. And he didn't stay in New York and try to be a star in the abstract expressionist world. The main things I've done it professionally is develop land and, and be an artist. Maybe they're both the same thing. A lot of the things I've used in development really pertain to art. It's, it's, it's making decisions about what looks good. I remember going over to his place in Slidell, and I brought a book I wrote on Leonardo da Vinci, because da Vinci reminds me so much of George. They both love the earth. They love the way water moves. And George has that curiosity that comes from observing things, finding a joy in nature, and wondering what's underneath. And you see that in all of his art. No, Bayou is a, a mystical to change direction often. And the wetlands are constantly changing in texture and color. They're more mystical than a river. And I live right the bayou right in front of my house. I planned it that way. I enjoy the aspect of when I did it in such a way where it looked as though it belonged. I used to try to mark a road to take advantage of certain landscapes. Finally, I'd get on the bulldozer myself very slowly and go around that area that I wanted it. He would take these tracts of land and it was like a canvas and, and he would work them like a, like a painting and, and carve, you know, canals to make the water work and roads and keep all the best trees. Moving dirt is a form of land sculpture. The satisfaction is the same as painting. When you get it right, you sense it's right. He made his money um, in land development. And this was a time of total freedom. He was, he was developing land on the North Shore. There was no governmental oversight. George Dunbar did things that you couldn't do today with land development. You couldn't go to the bayous and dig your own new bayou. You couldn't do any of that. And I think one of the fascinating things that people have certainly spoken about with George is that he didn't flatten the earth, which was a typical developer technique. He actually shaped the earth and dug these bayous and created another art form with these properties along the bayous in Slidell. He developed over 65 neighborhoods in, in the North Shore, and there's so many people that have waterfront homes because of George. I don't think they all know the impact that he's had on this area. We like to claim him maybe more than New Orleans does, so. <laughs> and one thing about George is his life, that everyday practice, whether it's driving a bulldozer and moving dirt, or sitting quietly and watching debris float down uh, the marshes, it makes its way into his language of abstraction and into his work. There's no separation of life and art with George. George doesn't make pieces of art, he's made his life a work of art. He basically designed the entire landscape in that whole neighborhood that he lives in. And, you know, he's out there with bulldozers, earth moving and uh, he, he's just, yeah, he just, he's, a, he's a maker. I remember when we were younger, pointing over at the property where he lives now. It was basically a mud pile with a lot of blackberries. And he said, you see that property over there, son? I'm gonna make it beautiful. And over a period of years, he'd get on his tractor, he'd get over there, and uh, sure enough, that, that pile of dirt with, with blackberries on it became what he calls Pleasure Point. And I've seen the landscape here on Pleasure Point and the property across the way as kind of a, a different kind of canvas. His interest in moving and shaping land, I think, was a 
parallel with what was going on in the studio. The same year I went to work for him, my dad had just died, and he became like a father figure. <sighs> Get a little choked up talking about him, I'm sorry. Anyway, it was just, uh, most of the time it was just he and I in the studio and long hours, uh, both workaholics. It was an old barn, had animals in the bottom, horses and dogs, and right in the ceiling of the low part of the barn, and the studio was in a loft on top of the barn, probably an old hay loft, very cold in the winters. Morning job was building canals and also building roads over here. In the afternoons I'd paint. And then at night I was teaching the ones, and I taught, taught at Tulane and at LSU. It really wasn't hard work because I was doing different things all day. There was a point when we moved out of the house. My parents were divorcing, and my mom stayed at the house, and we all moved out. And we, we needed to find a place, and he found a small apartment uh, near the railroad tracks in downtown Slidell, and we brought all the pool furniture. Dad lived in the living room. I lived in the bedroom. My brother lived in one of the other bedrooms, and Falwell did live in the closet. In the closet. And it was kind of like camping out. My dad never expected to be here in this tiny little apartment with none of his things. And we were cooking together and, and, and camping out in a way that I think for a brief moment, the structure that he created, the, the beauty and the control was let go. And I think he actually enjoyed it for a minute. We always were playing football out in the yard. We always climbing the tallest tree, the oak tree, straddling them with you know, bare hands. And who could fish the most? Everything was um, a competition. Just, just see who can run fastest down that road would be just constantly. Yeah. Go wrestle. Yeah. Um, who could swim at the length of the pool the, the most? They were pretty mischievous kids. My favorite story is my dad convinced my uncle Falwell that he was Hitler's son because they saw in the bayou just this scrap metal. And my dad was like, you know where that scrap metal came from? It's from when Hitler sent you on a submarine after World War II and here you are. Our dad just was so gracious enough to take you in. And Falwell believed that for years, for years. Louisette came to Pleasure Point just as dad had built this home kind of for himself. They began dating, and I think we were all overjoyed um, at that point. Say, like, Dad, you're dating age appropriately. So nice. We're so happy for you. Uh, you know, something different. <laughs> I never thought I'd be with someone. I was alone for 33 years. This was a real uh, a shock. <laughs> to fall in love and to... We, we were friends first, very well. For two years, yeah. She also, more than my mom, I then became really a studio helpmate. Yeah. She will very frequently go into the studio and is working with him. It's a, but it's a process. There is no downtime. It's a passion with him, so you have to respect it. It's a ongoing measure of his understanding of what life has given him. You feel that you join the team when you're with him. Hard day's work. He and Louisette are perfect together. Uh, they complement each other in so many ways. 
he, did, he didn't turn up. You know. My dad and my grandpa were extremely close. They were just two peas in a pod. He opened Palmetto's up around the time I was born. Kirk was, um, among other things, a great chef. Everybody cooks good around here, but he was heads and shoulders above everybody. A lot of the times my dad would be cooking for the family, constantly making sure everybody was okay, and would put his family and friends before all. I think he got a lot of that from my grandpa, a lot of that compassion and caring for other people. As time went on, little by little, he wasn't able to deal with the day-to-day -day as well as he always had. George did everything, everything possible to, uh, to help Kirk, and we all did. Just he wasn't able to get out of, a, of the tailspin of it. My brother had some struggles. And, uh, and I think my dad felt that struggle. My dad was somebody who always wanted to fix things. He could make things better. In the case of my brother, um, he reached a point where there was nothing he could do to help my brother get through his challenges. It was devastating for my grandpa to lose my dad. I just really wouldn't talk about it because it just hurt so much but he really stepped up for me and has been there for me through everything. He handles adversity incredibly well. Um, and he handled that the same way. I fell apart. My dad was strong. He was always um, a pillar of strength in our family. Good times and bad. His real estate business uh, had a horrible period and he lost a lot of money and was struggling to keep the family going. 10 years, probably 10 years, he worked nonstop to dig his way out. Katrina was devastating out here. We had water up to the light switches. The whole wall of the studio cracked open and fell out. The storm really came full force. He's so close to the lake, it really came with a surge that I don't think any of us expected. To my amazement, uh, he looked around and said, we can bring it back. I can do this. Doing the same thing over and over again is really not what, what art should be about. I try to change all the time. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm proud of it. It's more fun to try to reinvent yourself. Try to do something different. We talk about it every week, let's try this. You have to be aware when, you, when that accidental triumph, that thing that happens that is better than you planned, you have to recognize it. Do, do a multi go. Yeah, you want to do like a real yellow, like a French with you can take one of these and do it just in one color and then maybe run lines through it. You're so set on doing it a certain way, you have to be ready to accept it, something that might be better. That early period of his work, um, he was really just a part of the American art scene, the abstract expressionism. While other artists reacted to uh, the end of abstract expressionism by moving towards imagery and the figure, George never left the language of abstraction. And he dug in, doubled down, uh, and has created a singular voice. He really is a warrior. He looks like a warrior when, he, when he's in his studio there, you know. He's just brave. He doesn't just sit, sit on his laurels and reproduce stuff because it sells. He, 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 he pushes and pushes and pushes the envelope of modern art. He's a, he's a titan in the modern art world. I would say that George definitely loves scale on all levels and for him bigger is better. I think he finds that even if you have a small space, scale is, makes something more important. Uh, he'd always rather see a large piece on a wall instead of a bunch of little postage stamp small pieces on a wall. Something that one big impact piece can change a room. I think George has 
done something really interesting where they're all different periods of work that he's done, but they all sort of build upon one another. So you'll see the Rouville period has these leaf shapes. Partage is more of uh, architectural drawing, bands of tight lines that are drawn together. It may look like shading from distance, but when you get up close, it's really just teeny tiny little lines stacked one next to another. The raised surfaces would be like the uh, modeling paste surfaces. Where he's using big trowels and he'll put things underneath it, like, you know, bun bunches of rags that he's painting. At one point in the 80s, he was dealing with um, cloth that was rolled and then positioned on the canvas as sort of a, a sight line across, like a horizon across the canvas. And I thought those were really intriguing. And then he left that and moved on with these other works. He told me how he made those rag pictures where you just drop rags out of the top floor of the studio and see where they landed. And I was like, why did you do that? Why couldn't you just place them? And he's like, oh, so much of the energy is lost with that kind of meticulous work. <laughs> it's better to let the energy kerplunk. He's not wasteful in any way. It's he's actually, it's the polar opposite. You'll see some of the paintings are done on file folders that he found you know, that was like a business closing. So they're, they're built in there. He's got paintings that he did out of envelopes that he used for mailing purposes for some of his developments. He'll come and bring me, you know, pairs of pants that he doesn't want anymore and say, take the zippers out. We're gonna use those for something they're gonna be built in inside of the paintings. Well, I think George really found his voice uh, when he started exploring clay. He created something that was uniquely his own. Uh, and there's so much variance within it, you know? Uh, so it's not a one-trick pony. He's still constantly pushing uh, these forms and these ideas uh, within this medium. One of the first questions that we get, what is it made of? Um, George developed this remarkable technique of utilizing centuries-old technique of clay and water gilding, precious leaf application on the surface. You see how, it can, how smooth it is? Mm -hmm. I don't want to get it on you, could you? When we say clay, it's more like a paint. The Rabiskin glue is cooked to a liquid form and mixed with this very, very fine clay. So you'll paint these layers on, one thin layer after another thin layer, one direction and the other direction, letting them dry, and build up these surfaces. Then he'll polish those very smooth, kind of, you know, velvety surfaces. Then after that comes the leafing process. The gold leaf goes back to Trecento Italian panel painting. So it really creates a setting for the interpretation of abstraction, which are these finely honed and um, beautifully geometrical um, images that you find on his paintings. Yeah, how thin it is, so I think it's yeah. important for someone to re recognize just how thin this is. He'll lay down the sheets of leaf and they're hammered so that's so fine and so thin that they'll disappear in your hand if you rub them, rub your fingers together. He'll knock that off and do engraving through that or rasp on it or hit it with chains or whatever he can come up with <laughs> to distress it. You know, he shot, shot them with guns. He rolled them down hills, as he always used to tell me. Just remember, Red, that was my nickname. Michelangelo believed if you rolled it down a hill, whatever fell off didn't belong there. He's always working about four or five things at once. One of the Coindelestins might have 90 coats of clay on it, so you'd literally just be sitting there watching paint dry. So at the same time, on a separate table, he'll be doing a Rouville piece where he's really using his arm and he's using the modeling paste, laying that down and grinding away on it with grasps and saws and things. Those are just great to photograph because they, they really have so much dimension and it's particularly great to shoot him making it. He's so gestural and lyrical, it's almost like a dance. Uh, and, uh, and he just looks so good. I mean, he's got such great style. It's kind of a, a dream, a dream shoot, really. We sometimes take a big bell sand up. It almost pulls me over the, over the piece when it goes off, it's so strong but that big belt sander with rough sandpaper at it can put energy into a painting too. 
he's almost obsessed with that idea that there's something underneath that you can draw up from the piece. He goes, artists tend to add things. You're constantly adding things. He goes, I want to reveal things. I want to cut back and reveal the work that's underneath it. When you look at a painting, if you squint your eyes, and you can go to very good galleries and do this, very frequently, you can tell what was the last thing done in that painting, what was the last brush stroke. It's usually when someone comes back and edits the painting and tries to put something that they feel will give that portion of the painting a pop. And the problem is it doesn't stay on the picture plane, it jumps away from the picture plane. And that's why you bury things in a painting of this kind that's very tactical, so that you know that you can bring something up rather than add something. And I call it mining the surface. Now, these sumptuous clay, sort of almost three-dimensional surfaces with the gold leaf and the beautiful quasi-organic shapes. Wow, it's just gold, it's just beautiful. It just emanates this beautiful warmth. You know, the use of earth tones of gold and clay and platinum you know, are, are just inspiring. And I think it's something that no matter how art changes, this will always be a style that endures. He knows what he wants to do well before they're even started. I'll come in and he'll say, I made a great painting in my sleep last night. And I'll say, okay, well, let's make it happen. I've never seen somebody who's as good at conquering a project and knowing exactly what they want from beginning to end. It's a, it's a certain level of confidence that's really impressive. I defy anyone to not recognize the Dunbar painting. He established a signature. He never became repetitive. He always explored. We find elements of the previous direction in the current work so that you can, you can kind of trace a trajectory of thought and intent as you look at his work throughout the years. And they're not, they're not the same. They're different, they evolve. And the fact that it is so deeply personal and, and it's so visible in his work, it's indistinguishable from him as a person. When you're looking at the painting or the sculpture, you're looking straight at the artist. The nicest thing you could say to me as an artist, I went into a room, I knew it was a Dunbar when I walked, saw it on the wall. It's not what I've seen before, but I knew it was yours has been very generous with his time and talents to the city of Slidell. Therefore, I, Greg Cromer, Mayor of Slidell, Louisiana, and Leslie Denham, President of the Slidell City Council, do hereby proclaim April 21, 2022 as George Dunbar Day. His work was instantly recognizable by a number of institutions. His work is in the British Museum of Art, it's in the Whitney Museum collection. His work is really appealing to a very wide range of audience. He's been collected by three generations, and I think people of a very diverse background find something to relate to his work. If you look at the pieces of work, George has a much larger scale, but very engaging in the lobby of the Four Seasons. It's at the LLE building, New Orleans Museum of Art, and the Ogden Museum. George needs no introduction. He's tonight's winner of the Opus Award, and I'd like to start the bidding here at $35,000. $60,000 into the $65,000. At $65,000, we're looking for $70,000 next. $80,000. So $80,000. You know, George was in a movie once. You know, they filmed that Charlton Heston movie in Slidell and, and on George's property. In the film, Charlton Heston takes my dad's girlfriend. The story my dad, of course, tells is of talking to the director and saying, do you think that's realistic? He has a great sense of humor. 
is all about that story, about that, that perfect timing, that perfect story, and that was one of them. I suppose this is Daddy? No, that's my date. As a kid growing up, when you go to the Slidell movie theater and you see on the billboard um, number one starring George Dunbar and Charlton Heston, that's pretty cool. That was pretty cool. And I remember sitting at his house um, for many dinners and laughing so hard because he and Louisette would, um, they would say, would you like a clear? <laughs> what is a clear? Oh, it's vodka on ice. <laughs> They're fun. And they know how to entertain, which is so distinctly characteristic of New Orleans. So they have a, a little, you know, they have a crowd around them, a crowd of fans. This conversation's really making me want to go pay another visit to them. <laughs> we, need to, we need to get up there. The parties are always lovely, the drinks are always flowing, and we always have a great time. And it's just one of my favorite things to do. He's in the studio seven days a week. You'll know if there's a Saints game on, that's the only time he might not be in the studio. Other than that, he wants to be in the studio every day. It's hard to pull him away from there. George has a great work ethic, kind of fueled by martinis as well. He knows how to have fun. You know, he's comfortable in the life he's living. What it is, is a joy he continues to have in life, and that's expressed in his art. So I don't give him credit for too much work ethic. I give him credit for somebody who can really enjoy making art. He's one of the few artists that I've ever seen that will sign a piece on the top and the bottom and allow his clients to turn it around if they choose to. I don't know many artists who would have the confidence to do that. So George has a really wonderful collector of his who's a great friend and great collector, Kevin Clifford. He told us this great story about having a cocktail party at his house in Pasadena. He had a friend of his come up and say, hey, you've got this wonderful artwork here. When you have some time, I want to have you tell me about the artists. And he said, oh, that's going to be easy. It's just one guy. He will only purchase Dunbar work. You know, sometimes I say, Kevin, you know, don't you think we need to diversify the artwork? Nope. Don't like any other artwork. He goes, and none of it looks the same. Um, this piece, as you can see, this is uh, in our bathroom. We love George so much that we hung him over the toilet. <laughs> I do think that I'm one of his favorite clients. He's told me that on the side. When you go to one of his openings in the gallery, even though it is all about George, he never makes you think it's all about George. He's, you know, he's welcoming. He's so glad to see you and ask you what's going on in your life. I'm an art idiot. I, I really don't know, <laughs> but, but I like George. We have some things that, in common. George played quarterback at Country Day years ago. I didn't play at Country Day, but I did play quarterback. We both walked with a cane, so we have that in common. In my study, obviously, there's, there's a lot of sports stuff and some things from my, from my kids and some things from my career and football stuff. So that painting, that's Olivia putting it in there, but, but I like it. It gives it a little class, you know, among all the football things. You're putting a line of the color. Darker. Where, where you tear them. Oh, okay. They'll ask me sometimes, can I come and watch your work and things like that? The first thing he says is, bring them out for lunch. You know, have them come out here. It doesn't bother me. It, it really doesn't bother me if somebody's watching. I think George is intensely curious and interested in what you think. Um, what your opinions are. Um, I'm always struck by how he grabs you by the elbow and says, come here, let's talk. There's no five minute visit for a studio visit with George. It's, you know, 
where who, where's your family from where, you know come look at this and i'm planting these plants over here and this is my watercress garden now i'm getting a second line there you see that second line yeah that's what i was trying to do over there and i just missed he was really willing to share his his life and his experiences and i think that the the people that are his collectors they're his friends they become his friend one of the great things is going out to Slidell and seeing the studio, because not only do you see where he paints, but you see where he landscapes nature. I mean, he's built developments there. He's created lagoons and hills. And I think the moving of the earth and that landscaping that he did with his hands over the years is translated into what he does on canvas, but in clay and in gold. When you look at a piece of George's work, they do feel timeless. But in the very next moment, they have this incredible visceral energy that is immediate and of the now. The work that I'm most moved by is the work that I'm standing in front of. You know, because you get to have that incredible visual investigation of the materials and the surface and where the artist has really captured movement and time and frozen it for a concrete moment. You don't have to know what it is when you look at George's stuff, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's the sumptuousness, it's the elegance, it's the shape, it's the, it's the craft. The importance is in the painting. It's the painting, the process of making the painting and getting it resolved and then you move on to the next problem. It's problem solving, and you solve the next lot of problems, take some stuff that you learnt maybe from the last one. And I'll never forget one of the things that George said to me about his art and everyone's art, that a piece of art is never finished. There's always one more stroke or one more touch, one more thing that you can do. At some point, you just have to say, this is it, out it goes. I enjoy doing something new and something different and something better. I think that George's message is that he doesn't have a favorite piece of art. Because if he did, that means he'd, he's done. And he's always looking for that to make that favorite piece. And that's what keeps him going. And it's the process. Uh, and I think we try to communicate that to our students, in, in, in not only in art, but in everything. Uh, it's, the end, it's not the end game, it's the doing. Like I said to start with, I, I always want to try something more. I can never think of one time in my life where I didn't feel that my next show could be better than what I had before. It was the opening for our past exhibition when George pulled me aside and he said, I have to tell you something. So he said, I went in my studio this morning and I started a new painting. I have to tell you more about it. And this was in the moment when we had may maybe more than 200 people at the gallery coming to see his new body of work. But ultimately, his heart was back in the studio creating the next piece of artwork. It's astonishing to think, you know, at 95, he is creating new work and it's incredibly fresh and it's incredibly inspiring. And I do believe that if George Dunbar has his way, his last breath will be drawn in his studio working on his work. For his 90th birthday, I came up with this idea of creating a birthday party for him with this beautiful serpentine table for 90 people in the shape of one of the bayous he created. I said, George, I'd love to do this for your 90th birthday, what do you think? And he turned and looked at me and he said, no, I don't want to do that. He starts to walk out the door and I remember he turned around and he came back, he pulled me in close to him, he says, I want it for my 100th birthday. Okay, let's, let's, let's get going, come on.
George Dunbar Mining the Surfaces is presented by Donna and Ben Rosen and Bright Family Foundation and by the Hellas Foundation, the Selly Foundation Fund of the Greater New Orleans Foundation, Callan Contemporary, Fresh Poorman Roland Group, Alan Leventhal, Parkside Foundation, and Michelle Rainoir and Kevin Clifford. Additional funding provided by Michael Kearney, JKP Family Foundation, Simon Gunning, and Goldring Family Foundation.